Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Leaf. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and I research the mind-brain connection and have been in this field for 38 years. And I can tell you that your mind is not your brain. You are not your brain. Your mind actually controls your neurophysiology. So when you understand your mind, you can actually drive the changes in your brain and your body. It's under your control. You can be empowered to manage your mind. And this is what we're going to talk about in today's episode. Hey, welcome to today's interview. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Caroline Leaf to talk about her new book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, Five Simple Scientifically Proven Steps. And if you're on the Everford book club list, then you know that this was our choice for May 2021. If you want to join the book club, it's free. All you got to do each month is just source your own copy, whether you rent it from the library or pick up your own from Amazon, your favorite bookstore, whatever. But this book was so profound and gave me a deep insight into the clinical application and understanding, but also real life understanding of how to reduce anxiety, stress, and toxic thinking. Mental health is just as important as every other aspect of our wellness. So I would encourage you to not only tune in today and enjoy the episode, but definitely get her book as well, but also try to shift your perspective, shift your mindset into honoring and respecting what is going on up here in your head as much as what you are doing to transform your body, to maintain wellness, whatever your current health and fitness goals are, your mental health, your mental fitness, your mind management, as Dr. Leaf talks about, is just as important. And you're going to learn how actually it may be driving the ship in terms of why you're seeing success or not in the gym, in life. What we do up here drives the rest of our body. It even relates to our longevity in life. It breaks down into our telomeres. So what you're thinking up here transcends into every aspect, every cell of your body. So if you're not happy with how the rest of your life is going, if you seem to be doing all the right things, ask the hard question. Am I understanding my mental mess and working on that as much as I am everything else? Welcome to Ever Forward Radio. Cleaning up your mental mess with Dr. Caroline Leaf. Um, I just want to, I didn't let you know before we hit record that actually this was, uh, I, I do a book club every month and this was our selection for May. And uh, Oh, wow. That's I'm wonderful. So, Thank so, you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for this work. I'm so glad to uh, have this conversation now and expand on the book and your work uh, and bring you more into my world and, and my audience and understand more of your world as well. So um, thank you, Doc, Dr. Leaf, I guess my first question is, the title is, um, I think at first glance, can maybe throw people off guard. Uh, it's kind of maybe insinuating. Uh, I don't want to put words in your, in your mouth, but let me know um, your mental mess. It kind of insinuates that it's something that we all have, right? We all have a mental mess. And so it's a very universal approach to help people clean it up. Was that kind of your thought process in titling this Absolutely. book? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There isn't anyone who doesn't have a mental mess. And if we deny it, then we're even more in a mental mess because it's so human. It's so normal. It's so okay to be a mental mess. And it's the hope that is part of who we are. Being, uh, being a human in life is not an easy thing to do. And we also can't predict everything. We, can't, we, don't, we can't control events, circumstances, people. So every moment of every day, we are like little scientists hypothesizing and you know trying things out and responding and trying to deal with things and it's very experimental so in that process sometimes we hit the mark and sometimes we make a mess and that's all okay and that's what I'm trying to tell people let's just level the playing fields let's stop pretending that some of us are okay and some of us aren't and that you're a mental mess and I'm not or that I've got to fix you and we're all a mess and we all go through degrees of mess and we're all cleaning up our mess and if you don't have a mess you can't repair and grow so the whole philosophy philosophy about I've been in this field 38 years now and the, the one of the re, real strong reasons why I titled the book this and my podcast which is very very popular it's called cleaning up your mental mess same, yeah. Deal, same thing deals with this concept of it's really okay we've got to give ourselves permission to recognize that we're going to make a mess it's totally okay it's a repairing process it's a growth process the thing is is not to stay in the mess the thing is is to own it recognize it repair and grow from it and that's kind of what i have tried to help people understand through the work that i do you, you have and you do. Um, and one of the things that hit me very early on in the book, 
Uh, I think when it comes to understanding our mental mess, I, I think for most people, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, we, 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 can, we tend to know. We, we have this thing in the back of our head or a gut feeling or a, a memory or an experience yeah. that we just can't shake. And you actually, mm -hmm. you, you hit that very early on in the book. I, one of the first things I marked here was um, a better and healthier mindset to have when reading about health and wellness trends is to ask yourself, why is this one idea resonating with me? Can you walk us through, like, what is that really? That thing that we probably know we want to work on that's in the back of our mind somewhere. Why does it just like hit home so much for us, but yet we kind of just glance over it sometimes? Well, the, there's so many ways to answer. That's such an excellent question, Chase, and I'm glad you've raised that. Basically, what we, we need, it, it starts with the fact that our, everything that we're thinking about is actually coming from a real place of a real thought inside our mind that is preceded by an actual mind experience. So if you have got, if you're reading something and, and you're drawn to that, it's because we recognize a need inside of ourselves because there's something that we have gone through or we're going through that is has put us in a position where we recognize we need to fix it. And this comes to the messy part and the cleaning up the mental mess because I talk a lot about the wise mind and the messy mind. And the whole point of being a human is to accept the messiness because that's kind of how we do life as it's this experimental process. But the wise, the messy mind needs to work with the wise mind, which is that instinct of knowing and and in order to repair and grow. So when you're drawn to something, so you're reading something in the wellness space, or you're listening to a podcast, or you choose to even listen to a podcast like this, is that that that's your wise mind saying, hey, okay, there's things in your life, there's patterns in your life, there's things going on in everyone's lives. And there's something's caught you about what you're hearing or reading. And it's it's, it's basically giving you, you kind of seek your wise minds prompting you to seek the knowledge that you need in order to repair. So it's kind of like we become thought detectives. So we, yeah, that's, that's yes. the one reason. And when we've got something in our life, you know, we can probably dive into this as we go along, but a thought is a real thing. And the way you show up is based on on thoughts and thoughts are real things that you've built into your brain and your body and your mind, three places that come from the process of mind in action, which is your thinking, feeling and choosing, which is how you experience the world. So how you've experienced the world is literally converted through your mind into your brain as real, real structures. And I'm going to hold up a little tree and we can talk in depth and unpack this in whichever way direction you want to go. But you'll see the trees in my book. Here's a little tree. And this is what thoughts look like, literally look like trees. And when they are healthy, they, they I use the green tree. When they're toxic, I use the toxic tree. So anything that we have gone through becomes these physical protein tree-like structures in our brain and they affect our DNA and also in the, the gravitational fields and electromagnetic fields of the mind, which is literally the life force, the energy, the energy, electromagnetic energy, all that kind of stuff. And it's there and it's real. So if we've got this kind of thing, this kind of toxic issue, it could be anything. It might be the experiences of COVID and how that's maybe disrupted one's feeling of, of well-being and that there's a recognition, I need to get my life back on track. So they, there's this, there's, the roots would be the source, the branches would be the interpretation of so how you uniquely think, feel and choose about the experience. And this has created, created a threat to one's survival. So the brain and body are responding by sending you signals like how you feel physically and just these sensations. And then your mind is responding by actually drawing you towards reading that book in that well, that in the, in the wellness space or listening to this podcast. So this is literally your mind, brain, and body, your psychoneurobiology, wanting to repair this because this threatens survival. There's something here and you'd been drawn to fix it. That you, That's your wise mind calling you to fix up the messy mind. So there's a, a real sign, actually a very, very nice scientific explanation for your great question. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it I makes love, sense. <laughs> I love the visual aids. I'm a visual learner, so that was great. I will definitely have to, anybody's curious, make sure to check out the video podcast here as well. Uh, and you kind of touched on where I wanted to go next already in biology. And you were talking about, you know, maybe someone's dealing with COVID or maybe someone's dealing with a chronic illness, a, a mental illness, a physical illness, some, anything that's affecting our physiological state, our biological state. You actually talk about how that can influence our mental state. And, and I think that's something that gets overlooked. People maybe discredit or don't fully give the respect that it deserves when we look at our physical well-being can have a direct influence and does directly influence our mental well-being. 
Uh, I know that's kind of a loaded question. We could go a lot of different ways, but could you maybe give us a high level of meaning of why our biology is so important, our physiological state is so important when looking at our mental state? And actually, almost it's an excellent question again, but I'd almost rephrase that, that your physiological state is dependent on your mind. Mm. And that's, yeah, so your mental state, mind, mental state would be the same thing. So your mind, so the, way, the easiest way to understand that is to understand that mind and brain are separate. Mind, brain, body are separate, but they're inseparable. So they work together. There's a very interesting relationship between the mind and the brain. So the brain and the body would be our physical, but the brain is not the mind. So the brain and body from the work I've done and field people in my field we propose that the mind and the brain are around about one to ten percent of who you are now if you're dead the difference between you and i and a dead person is that is our mind a dead person is nothing happening nothing going on your body's disintegrating but you and i are having a conversation listeners are listening there's we could put qeegs on your head and see brain activity and we could put an ekg on your heart and see activity and we could draw blood and you know you could test the blood and there'd be electromagnetic properties and in other words wow, because wow. of the life of your mind your mind is this energizing force that is moving through your brain and your body and so it's kind of like the it's 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 sort of between life the experiences mm, of mm. life and your physical so there's your physical being and then there's your mind and your mind is on a psychological level how you think feel and choose about everything that's going on around you that you experience and on a physics level it's quantum fields gravitational fields electromagnetic light forces einstein's work it's stuff that we've known for years but it's becoming a little clearer to understand now with with, with all the advances in, in science and technology we can start seeing that we know that we're not floating because of gravitational fields, but in addition, there is a unique gravitational field around you and around me, and I can't take yours and you can't take mine. We're generating photons, and those photons have a unique pattern, and they're coming from the, the interrelationship between what you're experiencing and what you've built into your brain and your body. And so it's a very, a very intricate, complicated relationship. When someone dies, a whole aspect of that relationship is gone. The energizing force isn't there. You're way less. I mean, you literally, there's something that, that literally is not there anymore. And it's very obvious. A dead person's not doing anything, but you're doing a lot. So that's a great way of kind of visualizing mind. And then, so if we take that aspect of mind and brain as being separate but inseparable, the mind is useless without the brain. The brain's useless without the mind. The body and brain are useless without the mind and vice versa. So there's a very strong feedback loop between the two. So of course, if you've had a traumatic brain injury, which is where I began my work in very clinical applications, as a therapist for nearly 30 years, working with uh, people with traumatic brain injuries and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, that's uh, sports trauma and autism and Alzheimer's and learning disabilities and severe trauma, sexual trauma, war trauma, that kind of stuff. So from a very cl in a clinical setting, I worked with people with mind, brain, psychoneurobiology to help them to understand, okay, this is how I'm showing up. This is how I'm communicating. These are my emotions. This is my behavioral symptoms. How, how are those impacting negatively? And how can we re reconceptualize those so that you can function at a higher level, socially, emotionally, cognitively, develop systems, research, et cetera, and then apply those into everyday life because we've all got a mind. We've all got this relationship, brain, body, mind. So it's not just in a therapeutic sense that we need this. We need this every moment of every day, because you can go three weeks without food, three days without water, three minutes without oxygen, but you don't even go three seconds without your mind working. Yeah. So we need, yeah. so, so we need constant mind management. So that in, in essence, then what, what we have is our mind is driving our brain and body. If we have a trauma, like a brain trauma or a brain tumor or a, a cancer in our body or you know diabetes or something, the physiology, it is, it does affect us you don't feel great so when you don't feel physically great obviously that thing feeds back into your mind and this whole thing goes and you don't feel as as great especially if you know it is affecting your uh, how you function and you can't maybe be as efficient as before and you can't do as much as before that certainly can more logically feed back into your into your mind but then there's the other side of the coin where and i've worked with so many researchers and scientists and doctors and there's much research out there showing that you can have two patients with the same type of problem, but one, it's really bad and life-threatening and someone else, it's not as bad. But the attitude, the way the person's managing their mind, how they're thinking, feeling, and choosing mm. 
to deal with that stuff impacts the effectiveness of the medication, the, the course of treatment, the course of healing, you know, and I've got one friend who loves to talk about this, who's an endocrinologist and, and she'll often say that she'll have two patients and one will be like literally life, their, their life is on the line and the other one's not so bad, but need, they need treatment. But the one whose life's on the line, they do better than the one who's not as bad because of their mindset, because of how they're using their thinking, feeling and choosing, recognizing the importance of not not just and I'm not just talking positive affirmations and wishful thinking and gratitude statements. I mean, those are all techniques that only work if you've if you're actually dealing with your stuff. They don't work on their own. They're not. You, it's like putting a bandaid on a bullet wound. Yeah. So you've got to look at it both ways. You've got to understand the impact. What our minds actually doing? So our mind is the driving force. And you mentioned there also a comment you made it's like mental illness. That's also we've got to be careful how we handle that because mental illness cannot be categorized in the same category as cancer and diabetes, etc. Because that's not one. It's not that it's not when you feel depressed you don't have a mental illness you're just having a it's a response to an adverse circumstance mm -hmm. and someone and if you think of a scale from zero starting at zero to 10 on one side and then zero to minus 10 on the other side most of us hover around the bell curve on any one day which is moving between minus four and plus four so the ups and downs of daily life and you know a bit of anxiety a bit of depression a bit of sadness a bit of happiness and we kind of it all balances out and we get through the day and but sometimes things really hit us and we have multiple things that really happen in our life and we slide down that negative side of the scale it doesn't mean we're mentally ill what it means is that we have extreme um, overload of adverse circumstances and we're responding now because our mind is the thing that experiences whatever the trauma the abuse the it's our mind and then into the brain and then from the brain into the body, because of that root, there is a neurophysiological response. And that's, I talk about that in my book and in my clinical trials. We looked at people's narrative, what they are going through, the whole psychological mind side, and then looked at the impact on the brain, what's going on in the brain when you're totally depressed and your life's offline and you can't work and you're broken and this and this and this and all these things have happened. What's happening in your DNA, your telomeres, what's happening in your blood, you know, what's happening physically physiologically. So we see that over time, when we don't manage our mind, and we don't manage this relationship between mind, brain and body, we increase the vulnerability of our body um, to disease. So it's not like I think bad thoughts, I'm going to get cancer, or I do something bad, I'm going to get sick. It's it's cumulative over time. Because if we cumulatively get into these habits of get into the into the habit of being toxic in our thinking patterns, not dealing with suppressing our issues from the past, not facing those things, not listening to that wise mind saying, hey, go listen to Chase's podcast and let's like <laughs> learn how to manage. When we sort of, sort of ignore that or we listen and don't apply, we keep these issues. And when you keep those issues, you increase vulnerability in your body by 35 to 98%, which is phenomenal. You just, you, you basically increase the vulnerability of brain and body to disease. So if there's a genetic weakness, which we all have, it's inevitable, it's part passes through the bloodline there's, and it's different for everyone and we all respond differently and, and by the whole combination of nature nurture and I factor I factor being how I manage my mind I'm going to then impact how the brain and body are functioning cumulatively over time by the same token I can reverse that that's the beauty of this it's not a hopeless oh I'm going down a negative line it's a situation of I've got this amazing mind my mind is my ability to think feel and choose it's okay to make a mess this is how I can self regulate and manage my mind this is how I can then improve the medication to work better in my body if there is illness in my body this is how I can manage etc etc that's the kind of knowledge that needs to be taught to people, literally needs to be brought. And that's what I do with my work is to really help people to, to see that side that, yes, this has happened to you, but you can try, you can manage with understanding this whole mind brain, rewiring the brain, the time it takes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if, and you can actually then change what happens to you or how your, I mean, what happens in you. In other words, how it go, is going to play out into your future. And obviously, with the support of others, we need, we deep, we need deep, meaningful relationships and support in that process. So that's a long answer, but it lays quite a nice foundation for everything you've asked already. And I'm sure that you're going to ask. Uh, no, thank you so much. Uh, very, very well said. I, I appreciate um, the long winded, the short winded, all the wind. It's it's very very helpful information, uh, and I just like that all the wind. That's good. <laughs> <All> the wind. <laughs> Give it all. <laughs>
Uh, you actually hit on something that uh, I had marked again, um, actually on page 74 of your book. You see, uh, I'm reading your mind already, Chase. <laughs> it's like you're here. You're here with me. <laughs> I'm here with you. <laughs> you hit on uh, tel telomeres. And for maybe someone listening who isn't familiar with that, I mean, that is the key to understanding human aging, uh, how well or resilient or not so well we age, uh, longevity, quality of life. And you talk about here actually on page 74, it's funny, I just flipped to it when you were talking about it. In one of your studies, you're talking about how uh, your control groups relative age percentile decreased over the course of the study, which means that they got biologically older, whereas the experimental groups percentiles working on the mind management process, their biological age stayed the same. This means that if we don't manage our minds, the organs in our physical bodies will get older than our actual chronological age. That was so profound for me. And I think that leads into, you know, kind of my next statement slash question uh, that you were also discussing of the mind, the body, if we don't have dominion over, if we don't manage our minds, manage our bodies by the work that you're talking about for the mental aspect, but also physical, if we don't eat well, if we don't move, if we don't exercise, if we don't get hydrated, if we don't get sunlight, we are not building a strong foundation so that not if, but when we are faced with an external force, such as a virus that's been happening a lot this past year, such as, <laughs> um, you know, uh, some kind of other trauma or just the common cold or an allergy. Life. If, if life. If we have these things in us, in our essence, our biology, in our minds, then we are going to be so much more prepared for that storm. And that storm hits us in different ways. It, it affects our bodies, it affects our minds. Um, and so I think that's just a, I don't even know what the question is in there, but I just think it's very, very profound. And I hope the listeners picking up on as much as we may be doing to take care of our wellness and our bodies, this mental aspect, mind management is so crucial for preparing us for that future storm as well. I love that you brought that up. And I, I'm so, I always get so excited when someone reads the sort of research and the depth that you have, because it's the reason I put this kind of stuff into a layperson's book is because when you have knowledge and you understand what that knowledge means, your attitude shifts, and then you will apply the skills and develop the skills and find the skills from people like yourself and myself that will then help you make the changes. But just to tell someone, do these five steps or do you drink that green juice or go meditate? If you don't have all the understanding of what is actually going on, who am I? How do I function? You just won't have sustainability. You're always going to be looking for the next quick fix. So, so that I just wanted to emphasize that. So in terms in terms of the telomeres, it's a fascinating area of research, fairly new area of research. And it has been very much linked to, as you say, biological aging and has been generally researched around food, about around exercise and food. But there's a new body of research that's been coming through and my research is sort of part of that. I was very inspired by research done by various different researchers in the field. And that's why I included it in my study. And that is that um, telomeres are a proxy for how you're managing your mind. They literally, because your mind is the driving force behind how your genes are functioning. So telomere is the tip of a chromosome for those that don't know what I'm talking about. So if you cross your... Races. Exactly, tips, or, yeah. exactly that, or if you cross your fingers, you can look at your fingernails and those are your telomeres. So the chromosome go. looks like a little X. So there's two analogies and they're absolutely critical in cellular health and your cells obviously make up your organs. So if your telomeres are battling, your cells are battling, which means that your organs are battling, which means your whole body's battling. And so the research is uh, the mine include mine is part of this research body of research. What I just found recently, which you just basically read out part of it, is that if you um, are just like staying in the mental mess and not managing it, our bodies design. Funnily enough, our brain and body and mind, the three, can handle the mess if we're managing it. So there's a big if there. That's why I say let's clean up our mental mess. But if we just stay in the mess and we just go from mess to mess to mess, we are making a million new cells every second. And the more messy our mind, our mind is driving the genetic the, the ability of the telomere to actually be involved in cellular um, replication. Wow. And if, if, because if, if you did, you, you're not going to have any telomere functioning. You're not going to have cell division. You're not going to have cell replic, you know, cells, may, you may, we make a million cells every second, million plus every second. That's driven largely by the telomeres, which is, which are switched, the, the whole genetic process is switched on by an external force. That's our mind. So if you did, there is no mind. That's why there's no, 
cell, cellular growth. So you think of it like that. That's as simple as it is. So if my mind is messy and unmanaged, that's the that is the kind of electromagnetic field that I am sending through my body. That then creates neurochemical chaos. That then creates a whole confusion in how the gene code is activated, and that then affects the health of the telomeres, and they get weaker and broken. Think of broken nails. So that means that the cells that you make are going to not be as healthy. And that's what we track through the study as well, is that those in the experimental group, all of them at the beginning of the study, entered the study, the, it was a random control. So neither, neither knew who was getting the, the treatment and it was double blind. So neither they nor myself and my team knew we had an external team that was running the on the ground research. So they couldn't be, it couldn't be biased. And the, the those that, are, that were in the experimental group got the treatment, but all of them at the beginning had pretty bad telomere length. They, it was they, it was pretty bad. None of them were at their age that they should be. So what what telomeres translate into to, to come back to your point earlier on is that we can see from the telomere sc scoring and and percentiles and all the fancy stuff is that you can almost you can tell the age of your cells there for the age of your body. So we call that biological age versus your actual age. So in in age chronologically, um, I don't know how old you are. How old are you, Chase? Uh, I'm thirty five. 35. Okay. So you're 35 and we actually had a lot of our, so you millennial, we had a lot of our um, subjects that were sort of in that age group and older as well. But we had like a, the clinic, the, this case study I gave in the book is of, of a subject who was 35, not 35, in their 30s. But they, that was their chronological age, but their biological age from the telomeres was of a sickly 65 year old. So imagine I, yeah. Chase, imagine Chase, if your body was like sick, and I know it's not because I know you're into health and wellness and I know you'd manage your mind and that kind of stuff. Um, so it wouldn't be, but imagine that you feel terrible. Imagine being in a body of a 65 year old that's sick, but when you're 30, when you're in your thirties, you know, so that's what we saw. We saw within nine weeks, we saw that being reversed. Those wow. that were in treatment, there was no medication involved. There was no um, dietary exercise and not that I'm anti dietary exercise, et cetera. I'm obviously pro that it's part of what I teach, but in this particular trial, we just looked at mind management as the primary factor to get right. And then we can add all those other things on once your mind is right, because your mind influences the effectiveness of those anyway. I mean, your mind, if you're eating a healthy meal and you have just done a workout, if you if you did the workout and ate, eat the healthy meal with a bad attitude, or you haven't dealt with something, or you're consumed by mm -hmm. some toxic issue, you'll lose up to 86% of the nutrition and the workout you know, so and people don't again. realize that That's profound please it is profound so let's say that you go and do a workout but you're going into the workout worked up you just had an argument with someone you didn't resolve it and you're in there and you're just like mad and whatever and you're transferring it into the exercise but because you're in this toxic state and you're being consumed your dna doesn't respond the same way and you can drop off the effectiveness of your exercise routine you'll lose about 80 up to 86 90 percent of the benefits then you go home and eat a really super healthy organic farm to table egg SI ball, whatever it is that you do, but you're still in that state. You're still mad. You're still consumed. You've just lost up to 80, 80 85, 90% of that nutrition. So it's in your body and that's good food, but the benefit, you're not, because you, for example, your pancreas won't secrete um, all the peptides needed for assimilation because of the state of your mind. So the state of your mind influences all the cellular health, all the functionality of your digestive system, the functionality of your muscles, all of it's been driven by your mind. And we don't talk about this. We just think, okay, well, uh, four pillars. People talk about four pillars. I'm going to eat well. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to sleep. And I'm going to manage stress. And then manage stress, meditation. They've missed the boat. That whole lot is driven by I am going to. That's mind. So it's mind first. And then mind, okay, how am I going to approach exercise? What's my mindset before the routine, what's my mindset before why I'm yes, going to, yeah, you know, yeah. that's what we, that's, that's what we've got to look at you. You've got to look at what keeping you alive, your mind, what's yeah. driving everything, your mind. And that's why I bring it down to the telomeres. And we showed that reverse. We showed that person, that particular person I put in the case study. That's why I selected them. Their biological age went matched by the end of nine weeks was matching oh. their chronological you know they were going they went from i am depression my life's a mess i can't form a relationship i'm pretty much done everything i'm giving up i mean that's the summary of it it was very serious to within three weeks that person was saying i'm not depression i'm depressed because of that's massive and then yeah. by nine weeks which is the time it takes for behavioral change 
for time for automatization and behavioral change, that person was saying, okay, I have been experiencing depression because of this has been a pattern in my life and anxiety because of this, 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 and this, there's, there's all the roots and this is how I'm going to manage it. This is how I plan on seeing, you know, making this play out in the future. And because they'd gone through the nine week system, they were, their behaviors had changed and there were changes in their behavior. So they were talking like that and it was showing up. They were back at work, they were sleeping again, relationships like back online, et cetera, et cetera. And that is dramatic. And we, mm. the people that were in the control group, they never got the treatment, they got worse because we did all this testing at different points, all the psychological and narrative and blood. And so they were very aware, they just got worse and worse and it was pretty bad. I mean, at the end of the study, at the end of nine weeks, they went on to the treatment protocol. Um, they didn't, and they were on it then, obviously, and it obviously resolved th that issue. But um, the, so that's just to say, we can't just be aware of our stuff. We we can't. We have to go beyond that, and that's where mindfulness, meditation are very important. But that's pure brain preparation. That's pure brain body preparation. It's not enough. You can't just go do the workout. We read many studies saying that go and do aerobic exercise, and it does this in your brain, and it does. It releases all kinds of. But that's just the release. Now, what are you going to do with it? Awareness, yeah, yeah. awareness, and release alone. Like people will go and do yoga releases the trauma from the body because it will because it, it's like emdr it pulls it out the body through the movement into the brain and then into the mind and then but now it's here now i'm aware now what you, you can't just now you, you have to do a process and that's what that's what i've been working on is what's what's next what do i do now once i've done brain preparation what's the beyond state how do i now take this mind and the stuff that's come up and how do i live with this what do i do with this stuff and there's a very systematized way that we can direct our mind to direct the neuroplastic neuroplastic changes in the brain and therefore in the body and therefore the telomeres and all that stuff and all the things all the wind all the wind <laughs> all the wind all the wind <laughs> um, get the wind back in your sails <laughs> truly truly that's what we're talking about here um before i get into my next question i really want to i, I want to get to asking about you know really what is the mess and we've been talking about a lot of different things but i would love to hear uh, your your definition and just really break down what is the mental mess stuff. Um, but what you're just talking about there reminded me of an analogy, or something just came to mind. Again, I want to paint the analogy here of so many times we're trying to take care of our bodies, improve our lives, right? Well, what do we do? You usually start with the body first, like we've been talking about, yeah. focus on mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. physical, uh, physical activity, exercise, nutrition, things like that. But think about the person who is actually adherent long haul for a plan that they develop or what I'm trying to say is the person who go drags their butt to the gym or to a, mm -hmm. on a walk or a run and they hate it. It's, it's so like, just, they don't want to do it. They, they don't enjoy it, but for whatever reason they are, they're like, I'm supposed to do this. I have to do this. And then I, this takes me back to my health coaching clinic days to where people would really plateau or not see hardly any success or any transformation or very nominal. And it's because they hated what they were doing. They hated the diet they were on. They hated the workout routine that they had. They hated how much time or how little time they had. But when we were able to kind of shift, and like you were saying earlier, the mindset towards it of what do I want to do? What do I want to eat? What do I want to look like? How do I want to feel? And then build from that is the most beautiful, I call it the inception model, right? It has to come from their idea. Their, it's Absolutely. their dream, their totally. idea. Totally. Mm -hmm. And then they're in it for the long haul, right? Because I chose this, I enjoy this, or maybe you don't fully enjoy, but it, you enjoy it way more because you're not, you know, yeah. just doing something because you think you have to. So that's just another little uh, analogy. That's pain. so good. I'm glad you brought that up, Chase, because I, if, I don't know if you saw in the book, but I talk about empowerment and the pathway yes, yes. to empowerment. And that's this agency thing you're talking about. And mm -hmm. I showed very clearly across the study that people, most people feel very unempowered, feel very like I can't control this, especially when you, you know, if you're these extreme states, if you're in that minus four to 10 range, you feel like I've got, got no power. This is just too much for me and I can't ever get out of this. And it's showing those people exactly what you've just said that, hey, okay, I know this is hard, but what do you want? What do you, what do you need now? And starting from even though like, I can walk to, I can walk down the stairs once. That's fine. You start with it. I, I really want to eat all that, but I'll eat half the amount or 10% less. So I'll cut this month. Exactly. What can you do? And that's where you, so there's agency that's they being empowered. So eventually you can then look at that toxic issue and instead of being like trying to just push it down and run from it, you are 
not you don't use you language you, you mean i language you actually you okay you what are you doing what do you want to do so you speak to yourself like that and there's a whole neurophysiological response in the yeah. brain mind and body when you do that um and then you start taking that that uh, that um, you start seeing that as not as an, a barrier and an obstacle but actually as an opportunity and it shifts and then you start seeing the, the the shift and the change happening and that's empowerment you know but it starts with it's always got to start people always say how do you Every person I've ever interviewed, and I'm sure you've gone through this, every patient I've ever worked with, every person I've ever helped, every, and we've had thousands, we reach millions. And there is unbelievable amount of people that were saying they had to get to that point where they realized that they have to actually make that decision. So many of my patients used to say to me, I can't. Yeah, yeah. But I say, that's fine. And, but realize that I can't is actually still a decision. You're still chosen. You know, you it's so let's break down the I can't. Maybe the I can't is I can't do that much, but what can I do? Yes, you know, that yeah. kind of thing is to get down to that point. And it's that then starts the shift to empowerment, little cumulative baby steps. And that's why the whole system of therapy that I've developed and the whole system of just general application, forget the therapy I've applied, but the book's not about therapy. The book's about people helping themselves because you've got a mind, as I already mentioned, you know, you can't, you can go, through, can't, don't even go three seconds without your mind working. So it's how do I wake up at night? My mind's going crazy. I'm at work during the day and my mind's ruminating. I'm sitting over a meal and I'm just like in a state. How, what do I do? How do I capture that? How do I manage that process? You know, so that's sort of where we're looking at to to help people. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so then, I, like I said, I want to shift into the mess. Um, I, I think when we say the word mess, when we say the phrase mental mess, um, it probably is going to mean different things to different people. Um, in your experience with your studies and just, you know, professional opinion uh, as a whole, what is the mess? Is it is it just life in general? Is it a trauma? I mean, to the person listening right now, I want them to really be able to identify, yep, that is my mess. I have a mess. I can understand where to go and to begin to work on my own mental mess, to identify it and to work on it. A very, very good example. So very quickly to answer that in two parts. First part is that remember your brain and body and mind are separate. So it's three things, brain, brain, mind, brain, body with mind dominating force um, and this feedback loop going on. So psychoneurobiology. With that in mind, it's we are, our mind is, with that in mind, our mind is experiencing life. So you open your eyes in the morning. Between the time you open your eyes and you go to sleep, you're experiencing the events and circumstances through your mind and those are being built into your brain and your body. That's what you do as a human. And that how you build them in is through your thinking, feeling, and choosing, which generates all those forces that I was speaking about and all the neurophysiology that happens. And if it's this, it creates a positive response. If it's this, I mean, this is positive. This is going to be a negative response in the brain and the body. So if now you wake up, you read an email, and you get totally irritated because it was a really nasty email, and you're totally upset and frustrated, and you just absorb all of this, there's the email in the roots. There's your interpretation of this. So as soon as you, so this is a thought tree. It's made of memories. The memory is the data, the data of what the email said, the content. And this, this is how you think, feel, and choose about that content. So how dare they say that? They said this, and so all your interpretation, your feelings, your frustration, your anger, that is physically built in your brain as a protein tree-like structure. And that then is going to be what you say, and then you, ah, you mouth off and you get mad and <laughs> you're feeling awful and your heart's palpitating because it's that as soon as it's built in the brain, it goes into the body as well. So then your whole physiology starts functioning and responding. So that now that's the first event. Then you get up and you and you have an argument now with, with the loved one because you're in a bad mood from the email. And then then you read another email. And there's something and then, so the day goes on. So during the course of the day, we we experience around about around about eight to ten thousand different events. Each event is built into the brain. The big stuff, the small stuff. Sometimes it's similar stuff very often, and you build onto one a thought that's already built from the previous day. And if it's toxic, and you add more toxic stuff, like maybe you hate your job, and you know, so this pattern it's all, it's it all compounds. building. It compounds. It compounds. It's compounding. Makes it even one bigger, nastier, uglier mess. Exactly. So there is the, it, and that mess is in the brain in the form of these protein trees that are as real as the COVID virus. And I use that because everyone's so familiar with that at the moment. And we know cool. if COVID it hits your body, your brain's immune system responds by sending out T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and macrophages to fight it. Well, your brain does the same thing for this, this threatens survival just as much as the COVID virus. Toxic thoughts, toxic patterns that build up over time are shortening lifespans. Federal data was released. It was picked up between 96 and 2000 
2014 that people are living 8 to 25 years, uh, are dying 8 to 25 years sooner than they should from preventable lifestyle diseases. And that comes from us not managing our mind and therefore not managing what we eat or exercise or day-to-day -day stuff. That's the mess I'm talking about. And eventually over time, your body will weaken. And that's the vulnerability I spoke about where you just, you can't keep battering your body. Your vulnerability constantly increases. And then eventually over time, you develop the cardiovascular issues or you develop hypertension and have a stroke. And, you know, because your constant chronic environment of, of, of unmanaged stress. And that's the mess I'm talking about. Now in between, it's not, bad all the time. For some people it is. Some people live in a war zone. They live in a in a family that's that's tormenting them. They live in a they go to work in a and they it's the only place they can work and it's the only place that they can earn money, but it's a tormenting environment. So some people are in more chronic st stress than others, but we're all battling in, in in our own unique ways. And that's the mess I'm talking about. And then along with that we have the extreme circumstances of someone who's raped or bullied or abused or lost a loved one or acute traumas, traumas yeah. significant traumas. So in the book I call them, you know, that we've that's terminology that's used often, but I talk about acute trauma, big T trauma, and small T trauma, all very significant. So I have a whole chapter dedicated to understanding what they are and how to manage them. And a whole chapter dedicated to understanding toxic habits, which are different. It's like getting into the habit of snapping at your loved one because they irritate you or getting irritated in traffic. Or And we think these are non-consequential things, but over time they are cumulative and they're like the dripping tap concept and eventually over time that chronic that chronic change that these toxic things are creating this immune response and affecting your telomeres right down to the, this affects telomeres and we've spoken about that already so i'm trying to show people that the mess is how we are doing life now here's the thing here's the good news it's going to happen you can't get away from it but there is something you can do you can manage it so you can recognize okay i got irritated 10 times today. In fact, I'm always getting irritated in this particular situation. Why? Get curious. Start becoming, looking, look at the patterns in your life. Own it. Don't judge yourself. Be kind to yourself. It's okay. You're a human. If we see our behavioral patterns as pretty much symptoms of an underlying reason. There's, the way we show up, our patterns of our life always have an underlying cause. And if we can give ourselves the grace to look at those as helpful messengers, which is very much a philosoph Eastern philosophy, how you are is because of something. And if you can say, okay, Yes, I was lousy and gossiped and snapped and got irritated and got worked up and I'm depressed. That You don't have to say, oh, I'm bad. I have a mental illness. That's not even science. The current narrative, as soon as you're depressed, you've got a clinical depression. If you're depressed for more than three days, you've got clinical, you've got a mental disease. You don't have a mental disease. You have a mind that is responding to adverse circumstances and it's got you in a place where you feel broken. And yes, it's because it's working through your brain and your body, your telomeres are affected and whatever. So you've got a, a physiological response, absolutely, that's making you feel even worse and increasing your vulnerability. And maybe it's been going on so long that now you have got a disease of some sort or you have now got cardiovascular issues or whatever or hypertension or something but that doesn't mean it can't be reversed that doesn't mean that your brain is broken and that you're a broken person and that you are now because of your broken brain you have depression and that's the message people are getting it's you you feel broken because of what you're going through your life story your narrative not because you have a broken brain and that's the difference we've got to stop saying brain 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 and look at brain as just basically the the organ through which we are storing the stuff and which is bearing the impact. Exactly. Exactly. And therefore, if we and because our brain is neuroplastic and our cells keep every second we're making a million new cells, we have a lot of power to influence and change it. That's why I did the telomere research. I show that when you literally cortisol, we all know about cortisol. That's why I use it as one of my markers. But the cortisol DHEA ratio is a phenomenal way of looking at also how we're managing our mental uh, mental health. A lot of research done around that. So I'd use that marker in my research. And what we showed was that people had excessively high cortisol and excessively low DHEA when they were in that toxic state. But as soon as they manage their mind, that ratio um, closed. So the cortisol dropped, the DHEA increased, which is what you want back to normal levels and excellent levels in nine weeks. I mean, this is phenomenal. And this was not through any 
therapy for me. It was through people using an app. I developed all this stuff is in an app called NeuroCycle. Nine and weeks they, is nothing really in, in the flash oh, of the pan of life. That's profound it's change nothing. happening in a short period of time. Exactly, Chase. And they worked for 15 to 45 minutes a day wow. on that toxic stuff. And then once they had got mastered the system in that time, it naturally carried over. There's a carryover effect. And what that means is that you'll use it automatically during the day. So here you're using it for your fixed period of time to work on the toxic issue. But then you, the pattern of how you manage your mind becomes, it's a, it's a system. It's like an Amazon delivery system. Amazon is the most phenomenal system. It has a system that works and delivers anything. The NeuroCycle is an Amazon system. It's literally a system of delivery that when you apply those five steps, you will make your brain and body work like they should. And then you'll create a feedback loop. You'll get into a wise mind and then you'll manage the messy mind. And that is in essence what it is. So the messy mind is all the stuff going on, but we and we designed to have the mess and to be managing it. We, we're not designed to, oh, I'm a mess, my life's a burden. I can't do anything. I give up. It's terrible. I'm depressed. I'm bad. I'm broken. I'm shame. I'm awful. Let me hide it. Let me pretend because there's stigma. I'm embarrassed to share with anyone. You get even worse and you crash. That's not what we're meant for. What we're meant for, meant to live as, is Yes, I'm a mess. Be honest about it. All of us are. I'm a mess. I'm battling. I feel depressed. This is going on in my life. It's overwhelming. Get it out. If you don't get it out, it goes in and you're going to transmit and you're going to blow up like a volcano. By acknowledging and talking. It goes in, it has to come out. It, it has to come in out. In one way or in some time. Yeah. Exactly. But by acknowledging the mess, seeing the mess as a helpful messenger, seeing the emotions, the behaviors, the perspective, the body symptoms as, as messengers, helpful messengers, we are going to then be able to manage them. And you, you change, you literally chase change 1,400 neurophysiological responses in your brain and your body. Increase your resilience and give yourself the capability of then managing fixing that issue so instead of just ah uh, i can't do this you say i've got the mess i'm going to manage the mess this is how i do it here's the system i'm going to sit down i'm going to do this meticulously over 63 days if a trauma is huge you may not finish it in one cycle i've had patients that had to do two years of trauma work of 63 day cycles and then we you know then they found more it's a lifelong process but you'll layers, get the basics layers it's well, layers yeah. it's layers but then as i said it translates over so let's say now that you do a lot of podcasting. Let's say now that you're in the system and and just before you interview someone, you get it, you get an email or someone says something to you that really throws you off. That like you totally that totally uh, what's it blindsided you and now you've got to get yourself together to get and do an interview and i'm sure that this has happened to it's happened to me where yeah, things like yeah. that have happened yeah. you can use the neurocycle for that too because it's simply a delivery system for okay this has happened do this 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 i'm back on track go into the podcast do what it is that you have to do come out and then carry on resolving it so it helps you keep your mind self-regulated that's mind management that's managing the mental mess I, I, I think that's just so helpful for somebody listening uh, to kind of really tap into this other area of their overall wellness that maybe needs improvement, or maybe you haven't even started yet. But it, it's just like what any good, you know, trainer or coach will tell you, um, oh, you know, hey, yesterday, I really got off my meal plan, or I, I went crazy on the weekend, they're not going to tell you to try to just undo every, again, a good coach, or a good friend here, it's not going to try to have you undo all of that. It's just not possible. Just like with this mental mess, it's it's not possible just to like undo it or to unexperience a trauma or to just no, it's the human. and yeah. You just it's part get of your back story. On track. Yeah. It's a part of your story. Yeah. And you have to just get back on track with what you know works. Go back to your system and go back to the processes, the people, the safe place, the uh the, yeah. the, the the mindfulness, the stillness, whatever you need to do just to get back on track. So knowing what you can do is first is step number one. It's not I don't have any idea on how to fix this. It's just you got to figure out this is where I am. I ha have a system or at least I'm going to create awareness to create a system. And yeah, then, then you have your fallback system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So good. Yeah, that's so uh, good. Well, Dr. Leaf, before getting to my final question here, uh, again, thank you so much for your time and your work here. Oh, pleasure. Uh, and um, again, for anybody in the Everford Book Club, you guys definitely really, uh, really enjoyed this one, hopefully for the month of May. I'm so glad to have you here to be the, the icing on the cake for the interview. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think what you just described in our conversation um, can be kind of summed up here in this other passage from your book on page 106, actually. So this is what the science means for you. You can transition from just being aware of your chaotic and toxic thoughts 
to being empowered to catch these thoughts in the early stages, manage them, and improve your overall peace and well-being. I, I think that's just uh, so well said and exactly you. what you were just talking about. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're not all hot messes and lost causes. Uh, well, we are all hot messes because we're human, but you know, we, we can just, we can come together and we can understand the system, which is what separates humans from every other animal in the world, right? This, this exactly. consciousness, this thought of awareness. Um, exactly. That so, hot mess is okay as long as it's being managed. Yes. And we don't want to stay in the hot mess. So accept the hot mess because that's tapping into the wise mind, messy mind, wise mind. So accept the hot mess because as soon as you accept it, we have a fantastic, sorry to interrupt you, but this is very interesting. No, no, no. We have a wonderful neuroscientific principle. And for those of you that are listening, I'm putting the toxic tree under the table and now I'm bringing it up. As soon as you are aware, as soon as you, okay, I'm in a mess. I've got this hot mess. What is it? Let's look at the signals. Let's look at the whole process. You immediately, as soon as you're consciously aware and start the process of digging into that awareness and then going beyond, you are weaken these branches, you weaken the protein branches, you it becomes malleable. So you get control, you shift the power balance. The minute that you take that con level of control, that's really core. Cool. That's where the empowerment will start. Yeah, I think that's a perfect segue into my final question. Uh, and living a life ever forward, the name of the show, this is the mantra where we're trying to bring awareness into these key areas of our life, our fitness our nutrition, our mindset, to help us just take at least one step forward to no matter what mess we're in, whether that's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial, whatever, just to gather ourselves, have a sense of awareness about it and to develop a plan to take a step forward instead of just staying in the mess. So I always ask my guests, what does that mean to you? Dr. Leaf, how would you say that you live a life ever forward? How does that fall in you today? Well, I definitely answer by saying mind management is absolutely key because it's the driving force. So with, as I keep saying, without mind, you're nothing. You, you, you're dead. I mean, your mind's through aliveness. So if my mind's always working, the philosophy that I've adopted is that then I want to manage it. I want to make sure I tap into my, to my wisdom, my wired for love mode, my survival mode. And that's the optimism bias. So, for example, we're not drawn to the negative to because we're drawn to the negative. We're drawn to the negative because it's an imbalance and it's threatened survival. We're drawn to fix it. We're drawn to clean up our mental mess. And a huge part of, of my mental wellness is, is understanding that it's okay. I give myself permission. I make a mistake. I don't beat myself up like I used to. I understand from all the research I've done, I've really, in, 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 uh, what have I said? If I've imbibed, I've literally lived for what I teach, that I don't beat myself up. I actually will accept like the guilt, the shame, the condemnation, whatever. I'll take that and I'll say, okay, what does this mean? What? Do, why, why, why am I feeling like this? What? How can I reconceptualize this to make this work for me and not against me, to make me a better person? And that's helped me get, as I say in my, own, in my research, it's given me an 81% plus a sort of power over uh, over the over negativity toxic thoughts depression anxiety etc so that's what i show in the research is that when you recognize that you can clean up your mental mess that it's okay that it's a helpful messenger you feel empowered to manage it by a factor of 81 percent an improved factor so i live like that i live what i teach it really does help me move forward amazing well uh, everyone, if you haven't already, make sure to check out Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. I will make sure to link that down in the show notes for everybody. You can tap that link and go get your copy. This has been an amazing read. And um, I'll also have your information there to, to connect more with your work and, and you on the website and social. So um, it doesn't end here, everybody. So Dr. Leaf, thank you again. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed talking to you.